Hello and welcome to Paris. I'm Editor Hattie Malik and I am joined by the lovely Joshua Graham who is our Fashion Features Editor. Hi. We're going to be kind of rounding up the first part of Paris for you. Um, Josh and I were really talking about the last, I mean I think generally when we're, when we're coming to Fashion Week and seeing all these shows there is obviously the feeling of there being a lot of clothes and a lot of stuff and the feeling of why are we here, why are we doing this? why the designers doing this um, and I must say for the most part about 60% of a lot of the stuff you do see does lack in kind of meaning or making you kind of mm -hmm. feel something um, and I think that's something we wanted to talk about today because the kind of group of shows we're going to discuss Martin Rose, Rick Owens and Louis Vuitton were definitely answering that question of when fashion can be meaningful and can kind of function I guess more as that debate of is it an art form but kind of it can function and do something for you yeah. but as well as functioning as this in this multi-trillion pound industry which is about selling and is about product and is about kind of I think it also raises that thing of kind of form follows function and what do these products do within your life yeah yeah what do they mean for the consumer for the wearer yeah how do they totally. make you feel how do they make you live really? mm. Um, I think we felt felt a lot we and, felt a and lot. lived, lived yes. a lot yeah. at Martine <laughs> Rose last night. Um, Martine usually shows in London, um, but she always kind of does her own thing off schedule. Sometimes she'll do fashion films, sometimes she'll do interactive experiences. Often with her fashion shows, they'll always be rooted in a community, a public space. They're never exclusive and closed off. It's always about creating a very genuine and authentic experience and we were talking about Martin yesterday and we were like Martin never tries to be cool or to capture what's cool. No, I think it's actually the opposite. I think she really plays with the uncool and mm. the um, sometimes the corny and the campy and mm. makes it cool because it's so authentic and mm. it's so genuine. And it comes from a place of being genuinely interested in these reference points, these communities, these things. It's not saying, oh, let's be subversive. Yeah. It comes from a very genuine place and you feel that. Um, so she showed in Paris last night at the Cuba Cafe, this closed cafe kind of at the top of Paris. That's a very Martine thing to do, to manage to find a venue that's closed and get them to open it up, back, back to her again. And we were all kind of crowded around this runway. We were told there was just going to be a screening. I did hear whispers that there were going to be a few looks. They basically screened this film that they filmed at the beginning of January with the models from the collection, kind of from the kind of looks that they wanted to model them on. And the audience were just family and friends to intentionally make those models feel really comfortable. So they filmed this kind of catwalk video, which is them very much having fun, yeah. posing, taking on these kind of characters that the Martin Rose wardrobe gives you. really playing with disco and dance hall and a ballroom. Yeah, um, for sure. The energy in the film really translated in person too. Yeah, literally, because then you'd have every other model in the film would then appear and come down the real runway in front of you and they would strike a pose, have a dance, everything that Josh just kind of explained, and then they would take their place along the runway, so becoming part of the audience and then at the end they all had a dance. Martine came out, Tamara Rothstein, stylist, came out and it was just... It was so immersive. Was so happy. It was... I mean, I can't even really describe the energy because in a real traditional sense, it was like when the models came out and they busted a move and they posed, again, going back to that unintentionally cool, authentic thing that mm. is really at the core of Martine. Because when you see a presentation like this, you almost think it's a little corny, right? It's like watching your parents dance at weddings. Um, but when you're in it and you're feeling the energy and the the love in yeah, the room totally. was like, it was so palpable and it was hard mm. not to feel really a part of Martine Rose's entire universe. And I think what translates really well actually is that sensibility and that feeling actually into the clothes. Yeah. It's not just that you had to be there. Um, obviously we were very lucky to be there. But you can, her clothes <clears throat> make you part of this community and they also, it's kind of creating this closed circuit back to those kind of communities and those reference points and those yeah. subcultures that are always kind of through lines in her collections and um, this collection we're both saying was one of our favorites i think one of her best it had one kind of, of refined I yeah refined kind of with martin rose touchstones to it kind of the tailoring with slight kind of yeah. twists to it um if we want to talk about subversive i would say 
the designs in this collection in particular, a lot of the shapes and silhouettes reminded me of 80s glamour of couturiers mm. like Angaro and Claude Montana with really strong shoulders and ruching and ruffles and ties but it wasn't in the traditional like silks and brocades it mm. was like these Frankenstein construction worker shirts and these bubbly camel coats that were really draped to make capes and really strong opulent garments yeah totally these kind of you know staple martin things of that take on tailoring your kind of cargo pants and mm -hmm. and shirts, the kind of layering of the tailoring over shirting and then kind of leather jackets, some kind of cape silhouettes as well. Some of those tailored kind of looks were actually kind of elasticated, kind of hemmed jackets and trousers. I don't want to get overly sentimental, but seeing some of these looks really reminded me of why fashion is so inspiring as a medium. Um, there was one look in particular, that leather trench with mm. the extra arms that were kind of tied into bows. And it just transported me to being five years old and taking my dad's old work mm -hmm. shirts and so sweet. tying them around as skirts or like capes or in my hair. And it does speak to what makes fashion so amazing yeah. and why I wanted to work in this industry to begin with, because it's how it makes you feel mm -hmm. and how it makes you kind of traverse Life. I think you've really touched on something there, with, which is what Martine manages to do so well, is it, it touches something in you which invokes memories and yeah. familiarity. There's a familiarity to what Martine does, but it's also intrinsically so original and unique. Like I was saying to Josh before we were looking through it, and I was like, I really want these cargo pants from this collection. Mm -hmm. And you may look at those and think, oh, well, you could just get kind of army surplus pants and yes you could that's also what's great about martine it's all about you can create yeah. this stuff yourself but there's something to me that's like special about the way that martine has done those pants the way that she's tailored them the patches on it but it, i like it and i connect to it because it reminds me of something yeah it's this really weird nostalgia because her references are 90s camden and mm. 80s raves and yeah obviously i was never a part of that and that community but it's all it's so ingrained in the martine rose ethos and mm. universe that like it's universally touching yeah totally um i want to talk about i think it's interesting talking about something so deeply personal mm -hmm. and based on kind of experience subculture community and then going on to talk about louis vuitton which is you know lvmh's cash cow yes. it is worth <laughs> over 20 billion dollars um it's one of the most recognizable biggest brands and matriarchs i'd say in the world yeah but then we had a collection from pharrell williams the creator director this was his second menswear collection is one that's definitely is going to divide people just it has divided people in terms of being about in principle about kind of more of a personal touchstone yeah. but people feel like possibly that it lost that and was a cliche that was about product. What yeah. I'm kind of referring to here is that he was talking about the idea of the, the cowboy and actually looking to the cowboy's Aboriginal roots, to the black cowboy, yeah. to those ideas to kind of challenge actually what we traditionally see as the cowboy. I think it's really interesting and the kind of criticisms I've seen of the collection um, are quick to harp on how groundbreaking Western wear is mm. in menswear. Um, and obviously the narrative of the black cowboy is also not entirely new or revolutionary if you've been paying attention like Lil Nas X's Old Town Road mm. came out four years ago Virgil um, also did like a Virgil did collection. one even Django Unchained was over a decade ago and it really played on these narratives and these ideas I don't necessarily think we should stamp cliche onto that mm. I think it's an important narrative I think white designers have long built billion dollar businesses on the white perspective of western wear like mm. Ralph Lauren um, and even Bodhi and their kind of folk yeah. take on it and I find it interesting that they're not tapped as cliche or, yeah. or, or picking low hanging fruit within menswear. I think it's also about actually that this is product to wear and mm -hmm. it's like why can't a black man into the narrative with his take on Western stuff as product, like you've got your kind of denim yeah. slacks in this collection. Yes, you, these are kind of the stereotypical elements of a Western uniform, but 
that's kind of what you want from a Vuitton wardrobe. If you're the Vuitton customer, yeah. you want kind of wearable product. You want your shirts, your slacks. I thought it was interesting that he ended this kind of dandiest era yeah. as well. Westernized kind of cowboy suiting in this collection, like that double-breasted white suit, which we were talking about. Um, with the kind of Dakota flower referencing different areas in America that he's looking to as well. Mm -hmm. It goes back to really our question of who is fashion speaking yeah. to and who's this for. And I see the Louis Vuitton collection and I immediately see product and maybe that's the, the cynic in me. Yeah. But I think there are going to be a huge amount of people out there that, that really see themselves in these clothes. Yeah, totally. Um, whether it is black Americans or the hip hop community that Pharrell has always really tapped into. Mm. Um, the collection also had debuted their Timberlands collab. Yeah, Timberlands. Um, which have been a staple in hip hop for ever. And mm. I would even call it hip hop's cowboy boot. So yeah, I think that's a great- So merging these worlds together. I, I think, think that's a really good term. You know, you've got yeah. the Timberland boots, you've got the LV Texan boot in this. Thinking about hip hop as well, you also there was a great long fur fur coat as well, and you've got those contradictions. Mm -hmm. But then this kind of building of a new language of different references exactly. of that with kind of then the Western kind of cowboy looks with the shirts and the sacks that I mentioned. Then your suiting, mm -hmm. new iterations of the speedy bag, Pharrell's infamous speedy bag, which was it was like two million pounds. Okay. Or something. That's just. <laughs> the ridiculousness of LVMH being a gazillion yeah. dollar company. And like through this, you've got, if we're thinking about through lines of Pharrell from last season, mm -hmm. he kind of last season was very much defined by the kind of Vuitton Damier check um, and taking that into kind of a camouflage kind pixelated. of zone. Yeah, pixelated zone. We had the return of that. Through some of the looks, Josh and I's favorites favorite thing is the what's it called the camouflage 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 and it is that pixelated print but it's done Cowbread. in shades of brown so then when you're far away it looks like cowhide i think that's hilarious and i think it also rounds up the playful campiness that pharrell has really tapped into with this collection mm, um, totally. that colonel sanders white suit with the bejeweled cacti on it was like a nod to Nudie Cohen and his Hollywood Western wear. I think this collection was fun. Yeah, I, I think, think it was, it was fun. fun. I do also want to kind of shout out and mention the Standing Rock um, shoe yes. drive. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, in his kind of press notes, Pharrell really keeps on referencing working with Dakota and Lakota nations, particularly um, this tribe who and kind of group of kind of artists and musicians who came out and did a performance and he was also working with for this collection like the Dakota yeah. flower that we mentioned on the suiting and um, it was opening that space um within Louis Vuitton savoir-faire and Parisian atelier excellence yeah. to a community that has long been excluded and I think actually how do you do that in a really powerful way that has impact by making it digestible and consumable. Yeah. And I understand why people maybe have issue with that, but that's also when you're at Vuitton, how you get a message out into the world. Yeah. Um, talking of getting a message out into the world, um, we want to kind of finish by talking about Rick Owens, who kind of pulled back this season in many ways. Um, he usually shows at the Palais de Tokyo. In winter, he shows inside the Palais. In summer, he shows outside. And you'll always kind of get lots of lots of the public kind of queuing up. Um, watching, I think Rick really likes that element that it's kind of a public spectacle that everyone can kind of mm -hmm. lick in on. But this season he actually showed in his house. He did three different seatings. So one was for friends and family, one was for press, and one was for buyers. Very intimate. Rick owns his house is kind of infamous. We'll try and put some pictures in here for kind of everything from the furniture to the sculpture. It's very kind of minimal, but mm -hmm. then you have these kind of odd things. So it was kind of amazing to be in this space. <laughs> but Rick was saying that he kind of didn't feel right showing at Palais de Tokyo with... Rick's always very responsive to what's going on in the world, um, you know, through COVID, through everything. His collections have always responded to that and he always talks about that in the press notes. But um, he said, and I want to actually read this out, he said, that this collection was very much a response to disappointing human behaviour. Um, really seeing how all of our different governments have responded or not responded um, to the wars going on in the world, the sides that they've decided to take. We can have a whole debate about this, yeah. but we will not now. But, you know, Rick was really pointedly saying, you know, he wanted to take things back and kind of have this intimate showing. And the collection also reflected that it was about kind of 
it was about both working with collaborators in a similar way to kind of, you know, if we're thinking about Pharrell working with, you know, community, localising things, but it was also about the clothes and putting things back yeah. and meeting them down. Yeah. What do you kind of feel like about that, that approach? Because I think it's interesting that Rick always references the world, but that he really pulled back this time. I think it's very poetic and I think the clothes really reflected that. Um, mm. I feel like I say this every season, but I can't help but really compare Rick to an old world mid-century couturier, someone like Cristobal Balenciaga, who was such a master with silhouette and creating shapes that felt simultaneously protective and empowering, mm. yet sentimental and, and comforting. And I thought Rick did this with those brown the kind of... The boots, yeah. Yeah, yeah they're yeah. like these inflated rubber pull-on boots, which he actually worked with an artist and an architect in London they're called Stray 2K. And I think you're really onto something there because it's actually Rick. It's one of those few people, no matter how much he changes it each season and plays with it, he's got this baseline of a very defined mm -hmm. sense of silhouette. Mm -hmm. And that is something that's actually really difficult and you don't really see many people managing to do. Like, there's such a lack of originality in the arts and in fashion, and you really see someone that actually has their own silhouette. Yeah, yeah, I think it also speaks to Rick as a transformer, as a transformer of the body and as mm. a transformer of, of the wearer. Um, the collection was Porterville, where he's from in California, and it must be really interesting for someone like Rick and everyone who's at his house and sees like mm. the life he's lived, what he's become and what he's kind of curated and to think about where have you come from. Yeah, like, totally. The transformative quality of fashion once again, like absolutely changing who mm. you are and how you live. And thinking about kind of he started selling his collections from this house twenty five years ago. Mm -hmm. Thinking about, you know, we started this review by saying who's us before but also I think that's something that not just we have to think about that as consumers, as press, but also designers have to think about what does fashion mean to me, who is it for, and I think this collection was very much about considering those things. I also thought it was interesting he was saying that he made this decision to show in his house and then doubted it because he was like, am I taking away the opportunity for people to come together and share in this moment together? And I think I like that Rick's always questioning and thinking about it. Um, you know, thinking about that very basic question, who is fashion for? Rick has such a cult following, such yeah. a cult consumer who buy these clothes. Such a community yeah. of people who who um, really understand him. And I think he really understands them. Mm. And you can see that because he's able to do a collection where he, in Rick's way, pairs things back. You know, you've got those kind of crazy inflated rubber pull-on boots, but throughout this you have, I think, the standout was kind of these more bundled looks, the knotted shapes through the mid mid kind of section of this collection, burnt oranges and duck egg blue, then felted alpaca capes, very much kind of this sense of ultra luxe fabrication, mm. but absolute kind of comfort that you desire it and you want to kind of cocoon and bundle up, shaggy alpaca, Japanese denim. He pins down his fabrications, he pins down his silhouettes. His customer kind of wants that, comes back for it. and. Mm -hmm. It feels like these are all clothes which have like a purpose and will go somewhere and will be worn yeah. and lived in and have a message. Yeah, and transform the wearer. Yeah, totally, totally. Um, I want to also just shout out Fecal Matter who walked the show. Rick was really shouting out his community, thinking about them. Who inspires him. Yeah, it wasn't kind of so intro introspective. It's a relationship. Action. I think it, fashion yeah. is a relationship between um, the designer, the consumer, the collaborators. This isn't a one-sided thing. As a consumer, you don't mm. buy something and let the designer do all the work. You totally. put something into it. This collection felt like it was that conversation as well. Yeah. Um, and I think actually all of these three collections we've talked about were about having that conversation with the consumer um, and having a back and forth with them. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think I think that's all we want to talk about with this. But let us know what you think. I'd love to know what people thought about, especially the Vuitton show and mm -hmm. um, everything else. Let us know what other shows on the schedule you were interested in. Um, we'll be coming back with a final Paris roundup for the menswear shows for, in kind of two days' time. So, yeah, let us know if there's anything we haven't spoken about and what comes up over the weekend. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.